In the beginning, when God created the various forms of life, He also created the natural laws, and among those were the laws of reproduction, ordaining that each kind should multiply. Moses records for us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit, or the tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself, after his kind, and God saw that it was good. The law of sowing and reaping is an immutable law in the natural world, and it will continue unbroken until this present natural order of things is no more. I think it's easily recognized in nature because we never plant corn expecting to reap watermelons. We never plant okra if you do, expecting a harvest of rice. But it's also so very truly applicable when it comes to living out our lives. The Apostle Paul appealed to this principle in his letter to the churches of Galatia. In that letter, he reminded them of their peculiar responsibility as Christians to those who taught them the gospel. He wrote that they were to provide for their physical needs just as those men had provided for their spiritual needs. The apostle reminded them that investing in spiritual things reaps eternal dividends. But dedicating our lives to the flesh, the treasures of the flesh, whatever they may be, will reap only corruption and decay. In verses 6 and 8 of the 6th chapter of the Galatian epistle, Paul wrote, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Then he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he... But he that, uh, for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now in our Lord's earthly ministry, he had pointed out this truth before Paul ever wrote it. And of course, as it is true in the natural world, then it is true in the spiritual world or in living life. Jesus said it this way, and what we have is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal, nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I haven't directed uh, your attention to these passages in, every, in an effort to get a uh, preacher's salary raised. I'm simply calling your attention to them because I desire you to focus on the immutable truth that Paul was really emphasizing here. Specifically, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. As you know, a bean seed will not grow corn. A corn seed grows corn. A seed of wheat produces wheat and only wheat. You may say, well, what variety? Well, it's still wheat. That's not the point. Wheat produces wheat. So the seed we sow in the field of life will reap a corresponding harvest. Sometimes, and I've heard it all my life, even as a young person, well, he's just sowing his wild oats. I never did hear anybody say, he's just reaping what he 
sowed. It's always, well, you know, overlooking. He's just sowing his wild oats. You just don't sow seed without having a harvest. Now, since we spend so much of our lives dealing with, with crops that came from seeds that we planted or somebody planted, we need to give, I think, close attention to this law of sowing and reaping and how this truth greatly impacts your life and my life. Because be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 7 of Galatians 6. Now I might remind you, you may think you can escape it, but there's no escape from this law in the natural world or the spiritual world. However, Paul indicates that even though we know it, we can let it slip. We can forget it. We can have it crowded out by things of this present world. We can be deceived about it. As the Apostle Paul wrote, we mock God thinking we can sow one thing and reap another. Or, if we do not remember what the Bible says, we hope that uh, that wrong seed that we showed, that maybe the crop will fail. But it just doesn't work that way. One reason we're often deceived about the law of sowing and reaping is because we forget some facts pertaining to harvest. But looking at the apostle and reading after him, you see that the apostle Paul is clear to the point, frank, candid, and candid, as he writes that we only reap what we sow. That just doesn't change. We cannot go through life living for the flesh and gratifying its appetites and reap a relationship with God and eternal life in heaven. When I was a young person, I was reading this article and by a preacher, and it was told, a story was told by the preacher, that this man and his son were walking down the street in a little town. And across the street was a man walking the opposite direction. And the father pointed to the man, pointed the boy to the man, and said, what a wonderful Christian he is, and what a godly person he is. The boy said, I would, I'd give anything to be that. And the father responded by saying, that's exactly what it cost him. But I don't think that's really in the minds of a lot of people. They know you plant beans, you get beans. But they don't realize when it comes down to specifics in your life and mine that you get right down to the nitty gritty, what do you give up to know more of the Lord's Word? What do you give up to be a worker of the Lord? What is there about your family life that makes you any different from anybody else? So the law of sowing and reaping is set and it cannot be changed. But there's one thing we need to know about the law of sowing and reaping. We not only sow and reap, and that's said, but we reap more than we sow. Those of us who have gardens or any farmer, whether he has 100 acres or 1,000 acres, when he plants whatever it is he's planting, he hopes that whatever comes up from one seed is going to produce a whole lot more than one seed. So it needs to be emphasized that God said in the beginning to the plants of the field in the natural order of thing, he said it to the fish of the sea and the animals of the forest, and even to man, be fruitful and multiply. So from generation to generation, each race doesn't merely only reproduce, but it multiplies sometimes many times over. Plant, a plant seed may produce many blooms, as you know. It may have a number of branches or fruit tree, with all kinds of fruit just on one limb as far as what it produces. And that's the way it works. The cycle goes on, and it's the way of life. Whether good or whether bad, the seed we sow in life not only reaps a corresponding result, 
but many times they are much further reaching than the original action in which we engaged. It's not unusual that the fruit is produced in the lives of other people from the seed that we have sown in our own lives. That's influence that by your actions you exert over others. Certainly it has to do with spending time to know the Bible so you can actually teach the Bible. There's no substitute for that. But just by the way you live, by the way you conduct yourselves. Think for a moment, and we'll put it right down to the family unit. If you have a mother and father who are charged by God to rear the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the father is head of the house to see that it's done. But yet they're lackadaisical in Bible study. They're lackadaisical in attendance and so on and so forth regarding the church. Now, what are those children going to remember from that kind of home life when they're adults? They're going to have to go contrary to the way they were raised rather than benefit from the way they were brought up, the way they were taught, and the way they were trained. Now, it is true. That just because people were raised in a bad situation doesn't mean that um, excuses them from their own personal responsibility to learn the truth and live it. But it does mean in God's infinite wisdom that when you have homes teaching the truth, that you're going to cut down on a lot of the problems that arise when they're raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's not unusual that the fruits produced in the lives of other people then spreads. Not only by the truth they actually teach in words, as Paul said, preach the word, but by the example that they set before others. Some may not know why you're doing what you're doing, but they know that you are routine at it and nothing hinders you from it. The prophet wrote, for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers will swallow it up. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. Albert Barnes has this commentary about this passage. They shall reap not merely as they have sown, but with an awful increase. They sowed folly and vanity and shall reap not merely emptiness and disappointment, but sudden irresistible destruction. It's always the case with sin and evil. We do not only reap what we've sown, and of course more than we have sown, but we also reap later than we have sown. In other words, we don't plant a seed one day and expect it to produce fruit the next day. Same is the case when it comes to your actions and my actions. Because we do not immediately see the results of the good we do or the evil we do does not mean that there will not be any. The same is the case regarding the consequences of sinful conduct. Because we're not immediately punished for our sins, for our wickedness, doesn't mean that we will not be. The law of sowing and reaping is immutable. You reap what you sow. Ecclesiastes 8.11 put it this way. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And that's pretty much the attitude of this nation among those who have at one time believed in God and the Bible and the Bible as a rule to live by. But it can also hit the church. How do I know? Well, the church apostatizes. The church can't apostatize when every member is loving the truth and living it. So if it apostatizes, some members at least had to cease to love God and the truth and the authority of God's word and do as they please. So we need not be deceived into thinking that we will not reap what we have sown. More than we have sown, and later, 
than we have sown. I want us to focus on the warning that is seen in this law of sowing and reaping. We must not blind ourselves, and that's usually who, who blinds us, is ourselves. But we must, must not blind ourselves to the fact that the places and situations that we many times find ourselves in are because of the seeds we earlier sowed. We will always reap what we sow when it comes to the choices we make. Life is a series of choices. If you were to define life, think about it. That's what it is, a series of choices. Those choices have then a result. They have a consequence. And whether the choice is big or whether it's small, it will not be without some kind of effect. That ought to be a thing that makes us think soberly about where we are right now and what we're doing, whatever time we have left on this earth, in our plans of what we're going to do. It should be then a sobering thing to think about the power that our choices have in our lives and in the lives of others. This is what Moses said to the children of Israel before they went into the land of promise. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you obey not the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. Then he said in chapter 30 and verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. But I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and and thy seed may live. So all of the following are, to say the least, incredibly important decisions. Who our companions are now, who our spouse will be, how we will bring our children up, who will be the father or mother of our children to help us bring them up, where we live, how we make a living, even our education. And you can go on down the line of things that cover every person ever lives as the decisions they must make. Every one of these things and more will impact all of us as we go into the future. Some of them will determine how we live the remainder of our lives on earth. If we make the wrong choice, We'll pay for it many times for a lifetime. Of far greater importance are those choices that will impact us for eternity. It's not to say the things I mentioned can't do that. But there are things that we choose in this life that may make it harder in this life, but really don't have a direct bearing upon our eternal salvation. But many of them do. A simple choice you make today may set you or your family on a trajectory toward eternal life or eternal damnation. I cause you to go back and think for a moment at the book, the book of Ruth. I think it's one of the most beloved books in the Bible because it certainly tells a story of love and devotion and redemption. But it also revolves around choices, good and bad choices, that people made that changed the destinies of quite a few people. If you go to chapter 1, you'll see it begins with the Israelite Elimelech and his wife Naomi. And they're from Bethlehem, Judah. Now a great drought and famine came upon the homeland, <clears throat> and because of that, they made a terrible and faithless decision. What did they do? 
They moved themselves and their two sons to the godless heathen land of Moab. Now that doesn't come out and say it in the book. But if you know the teaching of the law of Moses for the Jews, then that's exactly what happened. This was a foolish decision because the Moabites were enemies of God and enemies of Israel. Now, there's no indication in the book that they intended to live like the idolatrous Moabites did. It simply, I think, sets out that they made an economic decision concerning their physical concerns. But that also hits a lot of people now and will be in time. And they did pay a terrible price for their decision when they moved to Moab. Three of the four members of their family Imelech and both sons died in Moab and left Naomi all alone. Now, the Bible doesn't go into what Elimelech was doing. It doesn't go into what the sons were doing. It just says they died because it's not concentrating in that book on those things. But the fact of the matter demands some investigation as to why as Israelites under the law in view of what we said about Mo what Moses said a while ago Concerning, and in other places it says the same thing, about keeping the law that they would leave Israel to go into an adulterous land like that. Of course, we go further, and it's some ten years have passed uh, since they left Israel. And Naomi, a very, no doubt, heartbroken and financially ruined person, leaves and goes back to Israel. Of course there was Ruth, and we always spend our time on Ruth and Naomi. And that's good. What they did is, is wonderful. But we've got to realize they had to get to that point before that thing could happen. And that involves some poor decision on Limelech's part. There were two daughters-in-law. One of them left and went back to her people, but not Ruth. She made the decision to go with Naomi to Israel. She made a choice. She turned her back on everything and everybody, her culture and society, everything in life at that point to follow her mother-in-law to the land of Israel. I'd like to know more about that. We do know something about her uh, Naomi, because what else is said? But she must have been living a wonderful life in the midst of all of that stuff. I don't know what, like I say, Eliminate did or what the sons did. But Naomi now makes a good decision. But more than that, Ruth really made a tremendous decision. I think you can say that her decision was made in faith and trust to live among God's people. And you see that it changed her destiny. But it didn't just, just change her destiny. It changed the destiny of Israel. And if you really look at it, even the destiny of the Lord's church. We've reaped eternal reward because of the choice that Moabite made, widow made. I hope you can remember that as you look into the faces of your husband and your wife and your children. The simple choices that may run far into the future through grandchildren and great-grandchildren and no telling who else. Young people in particular, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh when thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. Build your habitual way of life on a thus saith the Lord. Obey the gospel as a young person. Resolve to serve God no matter the sacrifice as a young person. And you'll not slip slide away and get yourself into a lot of things that may be with you the rest of your life. Plan your course of life. Choose carefully. Follow the principle of Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember, we reap what we sow. 
when it comes to the deeds that we do. Moses told the people in Numbers 32, 23, to be sure your sin will find you out. And it will. You can't escape it. Solomon, the wise man who didn't live up to what he said, he certainly knew what he, by inspiration, spoke concerning this when he said, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs 131, 15. It just simply comes down to this. No one ever sins and gets by with it. There will, and emphasize this, there will always be a consequence sometime, somewhere, somehow, for the transgressions of God's law, whether omission or commission, that we make. In other words, sin exacts a price that we do not see when all seems to be just fun and good times. There is a vision that God calls the great prophet Ezekiel to see involving the priests of Israel. For these priests were engaged in idolatrous worship. Now remember Ezekiel had gone away into an earlier captivity and was already in Babylon. And Jeremiah was doing his work in Jerusalem before it fell. Ezekiel is basically saying, you're here for a long time. You're here because you were not faithful. You're suffering by the decisions over the years that you've made. And here is what God gave to Ezekiel. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jezani, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. They thought they could hide from God. They thought that he would just overlook what they were doing. Yet now, as Moses had warned and we read about earlier, they had gone to the ways of the Canaanites and others round about them. They'd given up the law and were living as the heathen did. There's no hiding from God. There's no getting away with sin. There is no sinning with impunity. We cannot undo what has been done. But God is mercifully willing to forgive. That doesn't mean everything that's come upon us as a pain because we made poor decisions we won't have to live with. But it means we know when from the heart we've obeyed the gospel, repenting of those sins and the process thereof, that we stand reconciled to God. In reality, repentance is the only answer and it's far more than saying I'm sorry. It means radically changing your thinking and your life. We reap what we sow when it comes then to the state of mind or the attitudes that we show. We just do not seem to see how our attitudes and actions toward our brethren, toward anybody else, toward other people eventually get turned back upon us when we are the ones who get into trouble or when we are the object of scrutiny. 
all of us are going to get into trouble at some point in life. <coughs> what do we do about it when we do? Well, when we come to our senses and realize that we have done wrong, we repent. Now, when we repent and confess our sins, <coughs> we expect the people around about us to be merciful and as generous as they possibly can be. That is taught in the Bible as much as baptism is taught in the Bible as a final act to get into Christ. But we're trying to say if you make wise decisions, if you labor toward that end, and that's your purpose and you're conscious of making good decisions as the Bible sets them out, you're going to cut a lot of those things off and never fall into them. Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Thus we want to be merciful and forgiving toward those no matter the mess they get themselves into, and it's their fault. They got themselves into it. But they've come to their senses. They've realized their sin. They've repented. They've done the will of heaven. And we ought to be there to bind up the wounds and help them out. In Luke 6, 35 through 37, we're taught, But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Now I think that passage and others like it are often simply misunderstood and errors taught on them. It doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to sin in our lives or anybody else's and also refuse to rebuke sin or to shun the influence of sin. Too many other passages teach that we're to do that. But it does affect how we deal with the sinner. The person who stands before God and says, well, I'm thankful I'm not like these vile sinners. We seem like have something in the Bible that tells us how God thinks about a fellow that does that. Because that fellow is not going to stand before God justified. Remember Luke 18, 11 through 14? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, <clears throat> I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased. Now, is that a rule? It's a mutable law. It will. And he that humbled himself shall be exalted. So this is an ancient and immutable law in nature and when it comes to living life in spiritual things. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. To sow to the Spirit is to know the truth. To be a spiritual person is to abide in the truth. It's the same as being faithful. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That is, we live our lives as the Bible teaches. And thus, if we're spiritual, it's because we do what the Bible tells us. We listen to it because it's God's directions to our lives, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We would do well in our relations to those about us to remember that we will reap what we have sown. And God forbid that we justify sin, but God help us to love sinners as God has loved us when we were sinners, and somebody loved us enough in the church to teach us the truth and show us the way of righteousness, and thereby lead us to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So I close the lesson by simply saying whether you're outside of Christ and need to become a Christian, or whether you're in Christ and 
maybe you sort of let this law slip by. The law of sowing and reaping must not be forgotten. Because I promise you, it will not forget you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we know what to do to become Christians if you're not. So why sit there lost and separated from God when the Lord stands beckoning to you, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest? Why as a child of God would you continue on a path that you know is doing nothing more than sowing to the flesh? It can't be good for you. It can't be good for your spouse. It can't be good for your children, your neighbors, or your brethren in Christ. It works right the opposite. But you will reap what you sow, more than what you sow, and later than you think what you sow. If you need to repent of sins and confess them, now's the time to do that is God's second law of pardon to the Christian. For we offer it now the time to do it at this time we stand and sing.